Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's good to see already some familiar faces uh, to these issues in national securities lectures and also some uh, new faces. Uh, welcome to this seventh session. My name is uh, Sergio Gomez. I'm an international fellow from the Chilean Navy uh, at the Humanitarian Response Program of the Naval War College. And on behalf of Professor Dave Pallati and the organizing uh, team of these lectures, I have the honor to introduce uh, this afternoon uh, Professor John Jackson. Professor Jackson has served at the Naval War College for more than 20 years, teaching in the areas of national security decision making, logistics, and unmanned and robotic systems. He holds the Elmer Ambrose Sperry Chair of Unmanned and Robotic Systems. His latest book, you can see it there, One Nation Under Drones, was published by the US Naval Institute in December 2018. Professor Jackson teaches the elective course entitled Unmanned Systems and Conflict in the 21st Century, which I had the privilege to be a student a year ago. Uh, this course provides students with a broad exposure to current and projected and manned and robotic systems in use with the Department of Defense and in the civilian sector. As a retired Navy captain, he served in supply and logistics assignments both, both afloat and ashore, retiring in 1998 after 27 years of service. He is also the program manager for the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Rating Program. Additionally, he serves on the President's Action Group and as Chairman of the 9-11 Memorial Committee. He is also an active member of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International and the Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned System Education and Research. Today, he will present a fascinating and technological lecture named Robots and Endman Systems in War. Please join me in welcome Professor John Jackson. It's probably the best introduction ever. I'm kind of excited to hear what I'm going to say. So uh, uh, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to have you here this afternoon. And what we're going to do is talk about unmanned systems and robotics. Uh, it's a very interesting, diverse group here. I've got a very young uh, person there on that side, and I've got some old people up there in the corner. Hi, Jim. I'm not talking to my wife, I'm talking to my buddy. So anyway, uh, we will uh, uh, go through some slides and talk to you about uh, how these systems are really uh, revolutionizing, how warfare is gonna take place and what's gonna happen on the civilian side as well. So. I uh, hold the EA Sperry Chair of Unmanned Systems, as was described, and uh, that's uh, Elmer Sperry, uh, early 1900s inventor of the gyroscope and a lot of other things. He uh, developed uh, one of the first unmanned aircraft, and I'll show you a picture of that. But I thought maybe to be a little more uh, distinguished, I'd grow a mustache. So uh, I did that. My wife said I looked like a porn star. <laughs> used car salesman or something. So anyway, I'm, uh, I, I shave the mustache very quickly and whatnot. But you know, particularly if you're a, uh, a, a army or a Marine, you're always concerned about what's over the next hill. Uh, Navy guys are always interested about what's over the horizon. And nowadays you've got uh, tools that allow you to see what's over the next hill before you have to go over and engage with those targets. It's not a new concept, really. This is the uh, Union Balloon Corps, Thaddeus Lowe, during the Civil War. Uh, they'd put an observer in that balloon and raise him up over the battlefield and see what the enemy uh, formations looked like and whatnot. So not a new task, necessarily. But nowadays, uh, you can't pick up a newspaper or magazine or go to a bookstore and not find something related to drones and how they're impacting us. Uh, Wired for War in the corner up there is uh, P.W. Singer's book. Uh, we use it as the text for the course that I teach, and it's, uh, it's an excellent book about how we got where we are today. 
and just a lot of other discussions about uh, how these systems are uh, impacting us. So is it a new idea? As I said, not really. If you look, this is the, uh, the Sperry Automatic Airplane. And this was in the uh, 1917 time frame. And you know, we barely could get manned aircraft into the air. Well, this is an attempt to say, let's see if we can take the pilot out of the airplane altogether. So what the Sperry Airplane would do is they'd load it up with explosives. They'd point it in the general direction of the target. They would launch it, and it would count the number of times the propeller would go around. And when it reached a preset number, the engine would stop and it would dive on the target. Not exactly precision guided munitions as we talk about them today, but that was the design and they managed to do it in, uh, in a number of tests and then when radio control came in, they were able to do even a better job of directing the motion of the, uh, the aircraft. Jumping ahead to World War II, we don't have time to go to every single year, but this is the, uh, the Denny mite. Uh, there was a actor named Reginald Denny ask your grandmother and maybe she will remember Reginald Denny, the actor. Uh, he was also fascinated by radio controlled aircraft. And so he built some designs that uh, proved to be very successful. If you're uh, an artilleryman, if you're firing naval guns, whatever the case may be, you need to practice. And so the way that normally is done is a manned aircraft will tow a target, will tow a sleeve behind it and the uh, People with the guns are told to shoot the target, shoot the sleeve, don't shoot the airplane. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't always work out that way. So uh, Denny said, well, maybe we could do a, a remote controlled airplane that would tow that target. And uh, during World War II, they built 7,000 of these uh, and used them with great success. So they were building these out in California and a photographer went out to take a picture of the factory and they found this attractive young woman building drones. And the photographer said, you know, she is really quite attractive. I wonder if she could do anything else. That's Marilyn Monroe. So uh, that's the ultimate bar bet. If anybody says, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start? It was building drones during the Second World War. Now I've been told Lady Gaga is getting <laughs> in the drone business, and if, if that's true, I think I'm getting out of the drone business. But, uh, anyway. anyway, this is the, uh, we call the drone survival guide. This is a human being down here, so this gives you an idea of the scale. These are not small aircraft. Some are, some are quite tiny, like uh, the Air, AR Pirate, uh, Parrot and some of the other smaller ones, but when you talk about the larger ones, like the X-47B, the Global Hawk, and uh, some of the other international partner aircraft, there's an awful lot of these things and they are really, really big and very complicated. So we'd like to operate these things. And so uh, breakthroughs in technology have allowed us to do it in a uh, rather unique way. And uh, are there Air Force officers in the uh, audience? Don't correct me. <laughs> Whatever I say, just shake your head and say that's right. So. Anyway, this is what we call remote split operations. And what this allows the, uh, the Air Force to do is to have an airplane in the theater. So if it's in uh, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever they wanna be operating, the airplane is here. The ground control system is in the United States. Uh, Creech Air Force Base is kind of the center for RPA or remotely piloted aircraft operations. But there's about 15 other bases that actually fly these aircraft. So the operators are here. This is where the launch and recovery element works. You communicate with these through fiber optic cables under the ocean, then you go up to satellite communications and you go back down to the plane. Well, doing all that takes anywhere from a second and a half to two seconds to make that loop. And if you're at 10,000 feet and it takes you two seconds for the plane to turn or go up or go down, that's not really a problem. If you're landing the airplane and something goes wrong and you say pull up and it takes two seconds for the airplane to react, that's not good. So the launch and recovery element is actually uh, Air Force uh, personnel in the area of uh, responsibility and what they'll do is they'll get the airplane in the air and then they turn it over to the operators back here uh, stateside. And when it comes time to land the airplane again, they will take over control, line of sight, and bring the, uh, the airplane down. Predators and reapers are the types we uh, predominantly are talking about here, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that. So rather unique, and the communications allows us to do it, what's the advantage of this operation? Well, 
you don't have to have nearly as many people in theater. Uh, you can have a small group, the launch and recovery element, and some maintainers there. You don't have to have the entire uh, system there. These people back here, this airplane can fly for 24 hours. So someone will sit down and fly it for eight hours. Somebody will tap him on the shoulder, get up. Someone will sit down for another eight. They'll do this for 24 hours. So you have great flexibility in terms of how you're going to do the uh, operation. So that's the way that the Air Force has uh, developed to use these, and it's been a very successful process. So let's talk about uh, hardware. This is the, uh, the Predator and the Reaper, which most of us have heard about. The uh, Predators originally were the surveillance aircraft. That's all they could do. They had no weapons aboard. <clears throat> Story is that they were observing one time, and they found a tall individual down on the ground with a bunch of people around him and whatnot. And they said, I think that's Osama bin Laden. By the time they were able to get another aircraft in with weapons to attack the target, they had scattered. And so they missed that opportunity. So the Central Intelligence Agency, who was operating these things at the time, said, can you fire a weapon? Can you fire a missile without ripping the wings off the airplane? Can you drop bombs from this aircraft? And in fact, you can. And so it now becomes both a surveillance and an attack aircraft. And the Air Force has stopped using Predators. They are smaller and not quite as, uh, as robust, don't, don't carry as many weapons, does not have as much range. And so we've gone to an all Reaper force. And you can see here it's firing a uh, Hellfire missile. Built by General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. Sounds like something from the Jetsons, if you remember that cartoon series. But General Atomics uh, built these and then said to the Air Force and said to the CIA, are you interested? And of course, they uh, decided they were. And in the early days, uh, the, the, the system was new and people weren't familiar with it. As they got more and more familiar with the, the operational concepts and whatnot, we developed up to 65 combat air patrols. So that meant that you had a Predator or a Reaper in the air, 65 of them in the air, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just an incredible capability. And even that did not meet all of the demands of the, uh, the combatant commanders. So uh, very, very interesting program, very successful program. This is the Global Hawk. Now, Global Hawk is strictly a surveillance platform. Uh, it has the ability, it's a jet-powered aircraft. It can, effect, in effect, fly from California to Maine, spend eight to 10 hours looking at Maine, and fly back to California. That's the kind of range that it has. Uh, the airplanes are operated out of primarily Beale Air Force Base in Sacramento, and it's strictly a, a, an observation platform, but it can stay airborne for, at high altitudes for extended periods of time and send back all the information about what the aircraft is seeing. You want to know how big it is? That's how big it is. Now, I'm six foot two, so you can use that as an indicator of how nobody's buying that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm not six foot two, but you get the idea. It's a pretty big airplane. It's not a model airplane by any stretch of the imagination. So the Navy said, you know, we like that Global Hawk idea. We probably ought to have one that can do open ocean surveillance. Uh, a, little, a different mission, and they developed a different aircraft to do that. This is called the Triton. It uh, takes off from a shore. It's not a carrier-based aircraft. Uh, it operates with the P-3s and now the P-8 Pat Maritime Patrol aircraft. And it can, as you indicate there, go low, interrogate these ships, decide whether they're a friend or foe, and if necessary, uh, uh, vector in some uh, aircraft to take action or vector in surface uh, forces to uh, board the ship and find out what's going on there. So the uh, Triton is currently uh, in operations. They uh, have a... Uh, Point Magoo has a base, and, uh, and Florida has a base, and they're becoming uh, part of the regular platform uh, used for surveillance. But the Navy said, well, can we fly these things from a carrier? And this is what they developed. Northrop Grumman built this aircraft. It's called the UKSD, the Unmanned Combat Air Systems Demonstrator. As you're all aware, we love acronyms, and that's, that's the UKSD. And the intent there was to say, could we, in fact, develop an aircraft that could fly from a carrier deck? That's how big it is. Again, uh, if you'll notice, I'm wearing the same blue shirt I was wearing in the previous picture. I brought these pictures back, showed them to my boss, and they said, okay, I sent you to Vegas for a week. You obviously were there one day. 
took all the pictures in your blue shirt, this blue shirt, by the way, and uh, then you went out and played golf. So uh, we learned at this point, at least change your shirt between each picture that you take <laughs> and uh, keep the boss off your, off your back. But uh, it's a good size airplane. It's an F-18 size airplane. Uh, uh, its wings fold up uh, so you can move it around on deck. And as you can see, it had uh, provisions for a 4,500 pound bomb load. Uh, they never flew weapons on it, but it was really a demonstrator. So they uh, got really good at this. This is uh, UCAS landing on the, uh, the carrier Bush. And the first time it made that landing, the Chief of Naval Operations was aboard, the Secretary of the Navy was aboard, all the reporters were aboard. It was not a good day to have a crash, and they did not. Uh, they landed very successfully. They say this airplane lands perfectly every single time, catches the third wire to the point where it wears the deck out in the place where the wheels are touching down. And it doesn't matter whether it's night or it's day, and it doesn't matter much about whether the weather is because the robot is perfectly able to bring that airplane on the deck. And here it is doing a catapult launch. So we built two of these as uh, demonstrators, and it was really an air effort to say, can we operate them from a carrier? Can we operate in the same airspace with manned aircraft? Uh, can we deck handle these things? You know, you always see the yellow shirts on the carrier deck going like this, and the pilot does whatever the guy says. Well, there's no pilot, so you have to come up with a secondary uh, approach to move the airplanes around. And they've done that by having another person on the carrier with a control center on his arm. And when the yellow shirt goes like this, he makes the airplane go where it needs to go. They're looking at uh, alternative ways to do that. You know, we can all play video games where it recognizes the movement of the arms and whatnot. And ultimately, the, uh, the deck handling will be done kind of automatically. But at this point, they didn't want to take any chances of uh, these things going off the side or anything else. So. And we even did air-to-air uh, -air refueling, one of the most demanding tasks that uh, any pilot has to do. And so this is the UCAS coming up behind a, a civilian tanker. And uh, sometimes they say passing gas, but I won't say that today. So passes the gas back to the airplane. So, so that's fixed wing aviation. There's also something called the RQ-170 Sentinel. And you may have seen this in the news. This is a stealthy drone. Uh, those are Iranians in the, uh, in the top here. And they captured this aircraft, the RQ-170. Uh, they claim they hacked it and brought it down. We think it basically had a communications problem and it glided until it ran out of gas and then landed in the desert. Whenever you see it, the uh, undercarriage is covered up with uh, sheeting and whatnot because we think it uh, made a mess of the bottom there. But initially we said, not our drone. And then we said, okay, it's our drone, can we have it back? And the Iranians said, no, but we'll share it with our friends, the Chinese and other people. And we've since, since seen pictures of very similar looking drones. Now we don't know if they have the capability to do anything other than get in the air and fly like a model airplane, but they, uh, they did in fact, uh, uh, cap not capture this thing, but obtain this thing and have uh, gathered a little bit of intel from it. Is there an RQ-180 uh, out there somewhere? I, I don't work in the classified world and I wouldn't tell you if I did. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't believe we've uh, lost a tremendous amount. You've all seen the famous picture when the uh, Osama bin Laden take takedown happened in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Of, the control center at the White House with the President, Secretary of Defense, Secretary Clinton, all of them watching something. Well, they were watching feed, video feed coming back from the RQ-170. So it's a uh, very interesting capability and it's stealthy, which is different than the other uh, devices that we're looking at. So we had the, uh, the two UCAS demonstrators. They flew very successfully, uh, multiple takeoffs and landings, refuelings, et cetera. So the question was, what is the next generation of aircraft gonna be? So the question was, is it going to be primarily an ISR platform, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance? Is it gonna be an attack aircraft where it can actually carry bombs and missiles? The Navy said it's gonna be a tanker. It's gonna be a refueler. A lot of people shook their heads with that, said, why exactly are you doing that? The Navy's position is we need an onboard, carrier onboard refueler. Right now we use FNA-18s carrying buddy stores, so we're using a high-tech jet 
to refuel other jets, and it's wearing out the airplanes, just not an effective way to do business. So we put out a uh, call for, uh, for bids on a new design, and Northrop Grumman initially was in the competition, and they dropped out. Boeing, Lockheed, and General Atomics all competed, and the, uh, the ultimate winner was Boeing, and they have uh, come forward with a design for what they call the MQ-25 Alpha, which is called the Stingray, which I like because I drive a Stingray, so I think that's kind of cool. Uh, this is the aircraft, that's their design. And you notice it's not a stealthy airplane. It's not a flying wing design. It's got a tail, it's got wings and whatnot. But that's what they believe is necessary to do the tanker mission. So you'll launch a flight of F-35s or whatever other aircraft you're operating. The tanker will go up, tank those uh, planes so they can go in and do their mission, meet them when they come back, tank them off so they can land and whatnot. So it's a, a legitimate requirement. And Boeing actually has an aircraft that's ready to fly. So sometime later this year, you'll see them fly the prototype, and then we'll move forward to build four of these aircraft, and then we'll take them out to the fleet and see how they operate. And how many we ultimately have on each carrier deck is, is yet to be determined. This is an interesting design. This is called the TURN, Tactically Exploited Reconnaissance Node. We, uh, we love acronyms. Uh, Navy's always wanted to get aviation on board surface ships. You know, can we have aviation capability without having to have an aircraft carrier there? So this is designed to go off a uh, flight deck of a destroyer-sized ship, take off straight up, transition over into horizontal flight, go 600 miles inland, do ISR or do an attack mission, come back, put its nose up, and land back down on the carrier deck. Pretty exotic stuff, but it's somewhat similar to what we did back in the uh, late 1960s. This is an aircraft called Pogo and the pilot would climb up into that cockpit with a big ladder and he'd lay on his back and he'd turn the uh, throttles and it would take off straight up, transition over, do its mission. When it came time to land, he's now looking over his shoulder and adjusting the uh, throttles. They did it a few times, but they didn't like it. And so they said, we're gonna stop doing this. Bottom line today is that com computer can do that extremely well. Knows exactly where the airplane is, where the flight deck is, brings the two of them together. So TURN could very well be the way that we're going to get fixed wing aircraft at sea. And uh, uh, it's a DARPA program, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency program, which is transitioning to the Office of Naval Research. So we'll see if it actually goes forward. Northrop has a contract to build a couple of demonstrator aircraft. So those are kind of big airplanes. We'll talk about some smaller airplanes. This is the Boeing in situ Scan Eagle. And this aircraft will fly for 24 hours on a gallon and a half of gas. Its engine is a converted weed whacker engine. And it was built originally to fly off tuna boats and look for schools of tuna and say that's where they are and then the tuna fleet would go over and uh, get them out of the water. Uh, after 9-11, they said, you know, I think this thing can do a lot more than look for tuna. And so what they've done is develop this uh, version, which will launch from a, a, a destroyer-sized ship. This is your uh, sensor package. It can fly with uh, various sensors, daylight, uh, infrared, etc., and can go out and do missions uh, up to 24 hours uh, at a time. Then it comes back and, la and lands, hooks onto a cable. So, you know, traditional naval aviators are tail hookers, well, this is kind of a wing hooker. And so they hang a, a, a line off the side of the ship. GPS knows where that line is and knows where the edge of that wing is, and it brings the two of them together. And as soon as it uh, touches that wire, they shut off the engine and they winch it back on board. Uh, they fuel it up and then they send it back out by, para, by uh, catapult uh, to do another mission. If you remember the uh, Marisk, Alabama, the Captain Phillips uh, piracy operation, Scan Eagles were flying over that the entire time, flying off the USS Bainbridge. So it's a fascinating uh, air aircraft system. The Navy has never bought one. The Navy buys data and a civilian company in situ flies the airplanes and provides the data. 
if there's no data coming in because of weather or mechanical problems, we don't pay for it. If there needs to be an upgrade to the airplane, the company pays for it. We don't pay for those upgrades. And they've made on the order of 400 upgrades to that aircraft since the program began. So it's, it's called contractor owned, contractor operated. And it's a very unique approach. So you don't have to spend the money to buy the machines. You just bring, buy the product that they produce. There's also a version which is called the Blackjack, which the uh, Marines own and operate. And this is the blackjack, a little bit bigger uh, size, same blue shirt. So what the Marines have decided is they are going to uh, fly these themselves and Marines are gonna maintain them and whatnot. They will fly from shore and do that same basic uh, mission of what's going on on the other side of that, that hill. Uh, have flown successfully and uh, they continue to enhance the, uh, the avionics packages and there's been talk of putting weapons on them. Anytime we build anything, the question is, can you put weapons on it? And uh, this does have the capability to carry some small weapons, but at this point, it's strictly a, uh, a surveillance platform. We continue to ramp down on the size of these things. You know, if you're out in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever you might be operating, and you wanna know what's going on, you can call the Air Force, and you can say, I'd like to have a Reaper come by, do a, uh, do a pass, and give me data about what I'm gonna see. Well, there's only so many Reapers, they may be uh, obligated to another mission and whatnot. So the troops like the notion of something that's organic that they have with them that they can take wherever they go. And this is the Puma. And uh, you basically throw it in the air, as you can see here, and it'll fly for about an hour and send live video back to uh, the operator. And then it's designed to land ashore or to land in the water, and you can go out with a boat and pick it up. It's built by a company called Aerovironment. Uh, they claim to be the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world because they've made over 7,000 of these kind of aircraft. They're not very big, but there's a lot of them. This is another one of their models. This is called the, uh, the Raven. And uh, similar, not quite as much capability, but the same idea, throw it in the air and see what you see. I went out to Simi Valley where they uh, build these and they said, would you like to go fly one? I said, would I like to go fly one? So we went out to this big lettuce patch uh, there in California and there were a couple of guys there and they were flying these things. And the Marines and the Navy and the Army require them to test fly 100% of them before they ship them. So I asked these guys, I said, how often do you do this? They said, 11 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> We are flying this thing. So I said, you want to fly it? I said, sure, let me give it a shot. So you, uh, you've got this, uh, it's battery powered. You've got this propeller in the back and it's So I throw this thing and bang, it hits right in the dirt, okay? The wings fall off and the tail falls off. Well, that's the way it's designed. That helps absorb the energy. So you pick it up, you put the wings back on, you put the tail back on, you throw it back in the air again. Twice, boom, right in the ground. So I said, you know, I think I'm not gonna do this anymore. They said, well, throw it like a football. I said, do I look like I know how to throw a football? <laughs> no, I don't know how to throw a football. But I said, throw it like a football. And he said, Ollie North took six times before they were, he was able to get it up in the air. So I got it up on the third shot. A little applause in the back, please. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's the Raven. And again, they've made uh, tens of thousands of these things. And the troops really like them because it gives them the ability to uh, have that control of their own destiny, if you will. This is one, another aerovironment program. It's called Switchblade. And what you can see here is it's launched out of a, a little tube, pneumatic tube, throws it into the air. The wings and the tail pop out. That's why they call it a switchblade and the operator is looking in this device and is controlling where the uh, UAV, the unmanned aerial vehicle, is gonna go. Unique thing here is it's got a warhead in it. This is the UAV you don't want to come back because when it launches, it is gonna detonate one way or the other. So you're either gonna attack the target you wanted to attack, you're gonna command detonate it, you're gonna fly it into a hillside, whatever it needs to be, but it's not designed to come back at all. But, Special operating forces, SEALs and whatnot really are like this. It's almost like a backpackable cruise missile, if you will. And again, that gives them the ability to, to attack a target. It flies for about 45 minutes and, uh, and then we'll go down and attack uh, you know, a bus, a car, 
it's a fairly small warhead. It's about a grenade size warhead, but it, it does the job. There's another version of this called Blackwing, and it's a surveillance uh, platform, and the submarine force launches these from submerged submarines. They actually launch them out of the flare tubes alongside the sail of the submarine. It flies up, and in effect, it gives you about a 500-foot tall periscope so you can see what's going on all around you, what's on, what's on the other side of the, uh, the hill, what's beyond the horizon. The submarine force does not attempt to recover these because you don't want to you know, give up your position while you're up there on the surface or something trying to recover them, and the cost is such that you don't, uh, you don't necessarily need to recover them. So. This is new, and I just recently put this in the pa package. This is an edible drone called Pouncer. So if you're doing humanitarian assistance, and there's a lot of people in that business here have done, uh, done a lot of good work, you need to get food to the people that need it. Well, you can fly a C-130, a C-17, you can chuck it out of the back, parachute comes down, maybe the pallet hits somebody, maybe it doesn't, or you take the MREs and you just throw them out loose and they flutter down wherever they're gonna go. The notion here is you can fly it directly where you want it, and each one of those little square colored areas is a different kind of food. So it's compressed rice, it's whatever else. The, uh, the structure is made out of wood, so you can break it up and use it for firewood. And they've even got a design that they're working on that would not be made of wood, but would be made of another edible uh, plant fiber material so they could actually fly it in where it needs to go. So interesting concept. And uh, you know, again, it's R&D, so we haven't gone too far down, down the range with it. But uh, the Pouncer edible drone. So we talked about fixed wing aircraft going from really big to really small. Let's talk a little bit about rotary wing. This is helicopters. And this is the MQ-8B Fire Scout built by Northrop Grumman. And the intention here is to, where on a situation where you have manned helicopters on board a ship, the pilots are able to fly a certain number of hours and then they have downtime, et cetera. This robot helicopter, if you will, can get up and cover the period when the uh, manned aircraft is not available. Uh, built by Northrop Grumman, that's basically the size of the Fowers Fire Scout. And the bigger version is called the MQ-8C Fire Scout. And this is a Bell 407 helicopter, which has been converted for robotic use. Uh, there's thousands of Bell 407s around the world. Uh, this notion here is it's getting to the point where uh, making it unmanned is, is kind of the easy part. So you put the electronics in there, you put the brains in there, you paint the windshield gray, and you can launch it and do, uh, do good work. So uh, Fire Scout has worked uh, both ashore and afloat. Uh, we lost one uh, uh, during the uh, Libya operation, but we didn't lose a pilot. You know, nobody was captured, nobody was killed, and so that's one of the big advantages of these unmanned aircraft is you do not put the pilots at risk. This is called the uh, K-Max, and it was a partnership between Lockheed and Common or Cayman Aircraft. And this is a 6,000-pound airplane that can lift 6,000 pounds. Uh, the thought was, the Marines said, you know, we have a forward operating base, and then we've got even further operating bases. We need to resupply them. So we take a couple of trucks worth of stuff, then we take a couple of trucks worth of people to protect the trucks worth of stuff. After a while, you've got this long train of people going down the road and improvised explosive devices, IEDs, uh, were the biggest single killer of, uh, of people in that war. They said, what if we could skip the roads altogether? What if we could pick up the material in pallet loads and fly it to where you need it? And they were able to do that. They moved hundreds of thousands of pounds of food uh, they, they did a two-month program, extended to a six-month program, extended to about a two-year program. And the guy on the ground just needs to shine a laser on the ground, and the uh, robot will drop the material wherever you need it to go. So the question now is, you know, is there money in the uh, budget for both Army and Air Force and Marines to use something like this? And the U.S. Navy's even looking at unmanned helicopters for underway replenishment, you know, ver vertical replenishment. So, uh, interesting piece of gear. Flying taxis. This is not what a flying taxi looks like, but it gives you the idea. This is what a flying taxi looks like. This is a Chinese design for a flying taxi. What you do there is you open the door, you get in, 
get on the iPad, you say, take me to uh, Cranston, and the airplane takes off. No pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger. <laughs> and it will take you where you need to go. Seems like a pretty exotic uh, concept, but there's a lot of work being done. Uh, Dubai is test flying different configurations of these, uh, these devices, and Uber and Lyft and whatnot are looking very seriously because they say, right now you can call an Uber and it'll come get you. Why couldn't you call a unmanned helicopter? You go to the top of a building, it picks you up and takes you where you need to go. So uh, we'll see what uh, transpires, but a lot of serious money being spent on those. So we'll talk about unmanned ground vehicles. We've been talking about things that fly. Let's talk about ground vehicles. This is a uh, German, a Nazi unmanned tank, drone tank, that was used in the Second World War. And it actually was not radio controlled, but it would string out a telephone cord basically behind it. And they would direct it up into a formation of people, up into other tanks and trucks and whatnot. It's called Goliath. And it was used uh, very successfully. These are some British soldiers who uh, captured some of these uh, uh, at the end of the war. We deal with mostly things like this. This is the PackBot, and this is a explosive ordnance disposal, an EOD device. You know, it used to be if you saw a pile of trash or something, you didn't know if it was a bomb or it was trash, you'd put on the big bomb suit, you'd walk over there, and you'd investigate what it was. This way we send a robot. It goes over there, it has radios, it has a video coming back, and you decide whether that's a target or not. If so, it can leave an explosive charge, back away, and detonate the charge, all without risking anybody's life. So uh, the troops love these things, and uh, they had uh, robot hospitals in theater, in, in country. If you had one that got broken or uh, blew up, you could take it back down there. This is me at uh, iRobot headquarters uh, in outside Boston. This is called Scooby-Doo. And Scooby-Doo uh, was uh, an EOD robot, and it was blown up, and the troops said, can you fix it? And they said, no, we'll have to send it back to uh, iRobot headquarters and whatnot. But again, nobody had to write a letter to a loved one to say, you know, your, your trooper was killed by a bomb. Instead, you said, okay, the robot was destroyed, but nobody got hurt. This is a uh, interesting, this is the Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System, Mars. This is almost like a mini tank. It has a machine gun, has a tear gas dispenser, has a laser dazzler, it has a microphone and speaker system. So you can roll it into an area, you can say disperse or we're going to engage the targets, etc. This is uh, Admiral Christensen, the past president of the War College. Uh, uh, the base security, when I called him, is that I'm bringing a robot with a machine gun on board to uh, do a demo. It took a little gymnastics to get him to approve that notion, but we brought it aboard, uh, and this has been used operationally in a number of locations. More current designs are, are being evaluated now. Uh, other countries have used these, uh, North Korea, DMZ, and whatnot has similar devices like this. So it's not RoboCop. But it's uh, you know not a totally different idea. This is Mutt, and uh, Marine doesn't look like he trusts that thing. <laughs> he's got, he's got a bead on it, uh, but uh, this is a, a device that is designed to carry weapons or maybe carry weight uh, supplies. Uh, a modern troop going into battle has more weight on his or her back than a knight in shining armor did when they were wearing their armor. So you're being asked to carry 100 plus pounds, go into a combat zone, and if you could find a way to offload some of that ammunition, water, whatever else you had to carry to one of these unmanned vehicles, it might be a very successful idea. This is a, a smaller version. This is a, the Dragon Runner. You can see how thrilled she is to have that thing strapped to her back. Uh, you know, there are different sizes. Little ones, big ones, bigger ones need, need vehicles to carry them, smaller ones, the dismounted troop can use them uh, to do the same kind of EOD uh, investigation. It's got manipulators on the end of it so you can move stuff and uh, do what you need to do to uh, prosecute the target. This is called a, a throwbot. 
and you can see the quarter there gives you an idea how big this thing is. I've got models of a lot of these over in the Future Forces Gallery if any of the students you know, have the opportunity to go down near the, uh, the Learning Center and near the Writing Center, you can see some of these, and there's one of these in the display case. This is designed that you can throw it off a third floor roof and it won't break. Uh, what happens is it has alter, it has a microphone so you can hear what's going on. It has uh, light cameras and infrared cameras so you can see what's going on in the location. They say what happens is you chuck it in the window and everybody would run because they thought it could, would blow up. So of course the SEALs said, can you make it blow up? <laughs> can, can you put a little explosive charge on there? And the company said, well, you know, I can throw it out the window and it won't break or I can make it blow up, but I don't think I can do both. So uh, at this point it's a uh, strictly a surveillance and observation uh, machine and uh, police are using it. First responders in the United States are using a similar design. This is uh, Boston Dynamics, big dog. Uh, again, I'm ta I talked a little bit about how you could offload some of this weight. Uh, there are tracked vehicles, there's wheeled vehicles, and this is one that's designed to walk, uh, like, a, like a digital electronic mule, if you will, and carry that equipment. Marines have experimented with this quite a bit uh, to see if it might be something they want to invest in. This is uh, Atlas. So this is a, a humanoid robot. You know, we all watch movies and the robots can do everything, you know, and in reality, it's very difficult to get them to walk and do what you want them to do. I uh, recommend you go to YouTube and you look up Atlas because there's a great video. Atlas picks up that box. The guy with a hockey stick knocks it out of his hand. And the robot goes, huh, okay. Picks it up again, he knocks it out of his hand again. And you can see the robot looking at him like, you know, when we take over, you're the first to go. <laughs> because you made me mad knocking that box out of my hand and whatnot. So it's a, uh, a, a lot of work in this area being done, and uh, Navy is interested in uh, having a robot firefighter on board a ship. Uh, you know, do you have to send a, a crew member in there with, uh, to get the smoke out of the space or to carry the uh, high pressure water into the space and whatnot, could you get a robot? And frankly, you know, you gotta step over those knee knockers and whatnot, you gotta be able to move around on board the ship. So it's a, it's a difficult challenge, but uh, they're, they're spending a lot of time and effort to be able to make that happen. So Naval War College, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Navy kind of stuff. There's uh, unmanned surface vehicles of various uh, sizes and shapes. This is the one that's most interesting right now. This is called Sea Hunter. And this is 131 foot surface ship designed to go 10,000 miles on a tank of gas. It is programmed to understand the rules of the road and avoid collisions, etc. And it recently transited from San Diego to Hawaii and back with no one aboard. Uh, Navy just put out a, a press release that uh, they're investing $400 million to do ad additional design work on a bigger version than this, something that would be 200 to 300 feet long. That would be part of what they call the ghost fleet. And it would have the ability to travel with full scale combatants. And maybe it's a sensor platform, maybe it carries weapons, uh, whatever the case may be. But uh, this was designed by uh, Lidos and has operated uh, successfully, uh, as I indicated, for, uh, for a number of years to the point where the Navy said, okay, it's no longer gonna be an Office of Naval Research Project. We're actually gonna go operational with this, uh, with this vehicle. Unmanned maritime vehicles, sometimes they call them unmanned undersea vehicles, autonomous undersea vehicles, lots of different names. Most of them you see are like this. This is a Rima 6000 um, from Hydroid. That's at Woods Hole Mar Maritime Oceanographic Institute. And these are free flowing, they're not tethered, they go where you want them to go. And these have been used to identify, find the black boxes on airplane crashes, uh, find uh, sunken ships from World War II. There's been a lot of press about aircraft carriers and other ships being located uh, uh, on the bottom of the ocean. And so they'll go down there and they'll identify it and then they'll bring back uh, other, air, other uh, unmanned vehicles to do some of the photography work and whatnot. So, very, uh, very interesting. Most of them can be no longer than 22 inches in diameter if you want to be able to launch them out of a submarine. 
because that's the extent of your submarine tube. So if you want something bigger than that, you've got to use some de delivery method other than uh, delivering them from a submarine. And this is uh, the Echo Voyager. This is, uh, it also is known as Orca, and uh, Boeing just got a contract. This thing is 81 feet long, about eight feet in diameter, and it dives to 11,000 feet. Not 1,100, but 11,000 feet depth of water. Uh, it is diesel electric, so it operates on battery for about 48 hours, and it comes to the surface, puts up a snorkel, runs its diesel generator, recharges its battery, and goes back down and does other things. So uh, what could it do? You know, it has a cargo bay that's about as big as a Connex box. Uh, you could drop mines out of the bottom. You could launch missiles or UAVs from the top. You could even have seals swim from it, not from 11,000 feet, but uh, in shallow water and whatnot. And so this is the, uh, the rollout of, uh, of the Echo Voyager. And that's me in the middle there. And since I didn't have a blue shirt, I put one on for, <laughs> for this presentation. To, might as well beat that dead horse one more time. So what a lot of people talk about is these drones in America's airspace. These are the ones that are, really scare a lot of people. There's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these small uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle quad rotors. Uh, this is some of the basic designs. I've got down in the Future Forces Gallery, you'll find this parrot on the bottom. You know, uh, Amazon is spending a lot of money to be able to deliver something to your house within 30 minutes of you ordering it. Uh, the question is, do we really want thousands of these things flying around back and forth, dropping off our uh, stuff? And porch pirates steal our stuff now. They could just follow the drone and maybe grab it when, it's, uh, when it lands. But a uh, lot of money, a lot of money going into this design. This is January 2015. You may have remembered this, but uh, somebody uh, got a little liquored up on New Year's Eve and said, I wonder if I can fly my drone on the White House lawn. And they did. They did, and got a lot of people excited because it's very difficult to uh, combat, do counter UAS work. Uh, the, uh, the Army and uh, others have said this is the single greatest threat to our forces because you can go and buy one of these things for a couple thousand bucks, put a grenade under it, and ISIS and other people have attacked US forces using these basic drones. So it is a, a concern. So for counter UAS work, you say, you know, how could we potentially stop this? You ready for the best picture of the show? There it is. <laughs> this is what I call my John Wayne show. Valerie made me, let me put it in the Christmas card this year. So, <laughs> so what this is, is this is a way to knock down a drone. And we went out on the lawn in front of the War College and we shot down four drones. And what it does is it has a compressed gas tank. It has a sight, so you follow the drone when it comes in and it goes beep, 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 beep. You press the button, it launches a projectile. When the projectile gets near the target, it splits open, throws out a net, grabs the drone, and brings it down with a parachute. So nobody gets hit in the head. You can go find the drone and maybe figure out where it came from. There's other versions, Drone Killer and others, which use electronics to jam the signal. But there's a problem you know, a lot of times when you're jamming that signal, you're jamming your own signals and you're jamming television, radio, and everything else. So the ability to use some kind of a kinetic device to uh, actually launch that projectile, capture it, and bring it back down is pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. They've even trained hawks to uh, attack drones. And the ASPCA said, well, you know, you're going to hurt their little claws when they get caught in a rotor. So they made little Kevlar gloves to go on their, uh, on their uh, claws, but it works. You know, it is, it is a way to, uh, to stop these things. So a uh, number of different systems, as I said, some are permanently mounted on buildings. This one is a shoulder mounted. It's been used to uh, support uh, Air Force One and other operations, so pretty interesting. The other one is uh, driverless cars, and uh, you know, this is not what we're talking about. You're not supposed to get in the back seat and let it go. Uh, Tesla does have driverless cars, and other companies are developing driverless cars. Uh, Tesla says, you know, keep your hand on the wheel. You know, it'll drive for you, but you need to be ready to take over any time something comes up. 
Uh, you may remember a couple of years ago there was a, uh, someone killed in, a, in an accident in a Tesla because a truck cut in front of them and the sensor couldn't tell the difference between this whitish blue truck and the whitish blue sky and the individual crashed right into it. He was watching a Harry Potter video when it happened and so clearly he was trusting the system to do more than the system is intended to do at this point. A uh, few more years, you know, I think you will find that they're pretty much able to do their driving by themselves. And again, Uber and Lyft and those guys are really looking for ways to use automated uh, auto autonomous cars because paying that individual to drive that uh, vehicle is, is an expensive uh, proposition. So. I'm not a fan of driverless cars, like I said, as long as I've got my Corvette. So. Anyway, there are issues for consideration, and I'll have a few minutes for questions here. You know, we talk about, is it legal to, do, to use these systems? Is it ethical? If it is legal, is it something you should do? Uh, unintended consequences, are we encouraging more terrorists than we are uh, taking out? And uh, they're being used against American forces. How do we stop that? And then there's domestic issues, invasion of privacy, you know. I've got a drone, I can fly over in my neighbor's backyard and take pictures of everything that's going on over there. Uh, probably not what we want to do. And uh, air, airspace deconfliction. You know, people have all said it's only a question of time before a drone flies into a commercial aircraft and causes a disaster. I wrote an op-ed piece that was published by United Press International uh, on the 5th of February that says, we, ought, we, we shouldn't just say it's gonna happen, we ought to try and stop it. Three pieces, we need to educate people how stupid it is to fly anywhere near aircraft. Number two, systems like DGI, which is a Chinese company, they build into their system what they call geofencing, and it, you cannot fly in a restricted air, airspace. It just will not let you do that. So we need to make sure that any of these systems that are imported into the United States have that geofencing capability. And the third piece we talked about was uh, malicious, you know, people who are doing this on purpose, and that's where you need something like Skywall, something like Eagle, something like whatever else to, to patrol the uh, airports and when something comes up, they're able to respond to it. So, One Nation Under Drones, got to flag my book. Uh, this is the book published in December. I've got a little info card there if anybody's interested in ordering it. Uh, it uh, it's 13 chapters. Uh, uh, I wrote two of them and I've got uh, you know, 11 other chapter authors who talk about legal aspects use in civilian industry, et cetera, and whatnot. So uh, we uh, use that in my class. Funny how that worked. How did that book get in my class? I don't know. But anyway, so that's it at the moment. Are there uh, any questions? Do we have any questions in the back? Thank you, sir. This was really fascinating. Um, my husband works for National Park Service, and they have problems with drones all the time coming into restricted airspace and flying. But then the Park Service turned around and used a drone for search and rescue. How do you start going about making the determination what they can be used for? How do you put limits on that? Yeah, it's a dual-edged sword. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of problems with forest fires that. Uh, People are flying drones uh, to take pictures and they've had to ground the manned helicopters out of fear that they might collide with the drones. Uh, police have used these for a number of instances, you know, lost people, they've helped uh, find lost uh, kids and that kind of thing. So it's a trade-off between, you know, what is the uh, situation you're dealing with. The FAA has established, you know, you can't fly near airports or higher than 400 feet within that area and you're doing it uh, for a good cause, you're pretty much okay. But uh, it, it is something that you know people are wrestling with because every day somebody says, I've got a new application. Precision agriculture is one that uh, has great uh, promise. You know, People can fly drones over their crops, see, okay, this one's infected with bugs, this one needs water, et cetera, and then you can adjust what you're doing in your crops so generate, uh, create more food, to produce more food and whatnot. So there's lots of positive applications, but there's also areas of concern where you've got to make sure these things are not out there causing problems. Other questions? Yeah. 
Okay, this is the Air Force. This could be this could be this could be dangerous. Sir Kevin James, Air Force. Thank you very much. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the strategic implications for the U.S. military in terms of changing the character of our forces, incorporating more drones, going away from manned systems, and some of the risks of that relative to our adversaries with this higher dependence on technology? Absolutely, uh, a great question. You know, they, uh, the drones are con particularly good to do in the dull, dirty, and dangerous work. So if there's jobs that are dull, looking at water, ocean areas for hours on end, you know, that's dull. So maybe we'd get a robot or a drone to do that. Is it dangerous? Are you flying an area with a lot of missiles and anti-aircraft capability? That's dangerous. Uh, dull, dirty, dirty. You know, radiograph radiographic uh, issues. We used a number of drones in the Fukushima uh, cleanup in Japan because we didn't want to put human beings in that area. So what does it mean for the, uh, the military? I, th I think it's an inevitable move toward using more and more of these systems, autonomous systems, uh, or if you look at something like Reaper, it's not an autonomous system, it's, it's flown, it's just the pilot is not in the machine, the pilot is elsewhere. So I think it's inevitable that we're gonna continue to move forward with this approach and say, where can these things do the best job? You know, loyal wingman design is, is getting a lot of play right now. And that notion is maybe you have an F-35 with a manned uh, pilot in it, and he has four or five uh, robot airplanes on either side of him, and it's carrying bombs and missiles, it's the bomb truck, et cetera. And when it comes time to attack the target, maybe the manned uh, pilot sends his robot in to strike the target. Uh, there's a design for something called the Gremlin, which is designed to fall out of the back of a C-130 or a C-17, small airplane, go out and do its mission, come back and be captured in midair, captured in flight, and brought back into the airplane. Kind of like they do air-to-air -air refueling. You know, you hook up with the, uh, with the uh, refueling hose. In this case, you hook up with something that brings you back in there. So, you know, it, robots are not gonna replace human beings. It's gonna be manned, unmanned teaming. It's gonna take place and we're gonna hopefully make uh, soldiers on the ground more efficient and more safe. People in the air, the same kind of thing. We're gonna be able to uh, go against targets we might not want to go against otherwise by sending in large numbers. Swarming is a big issue. Uh, you know, From the enemy's perspective and ours, we can defend an aircraft carrier. If you get eight or 10 targets coming in, we can probably stop those targets with Vulcan phalanx guns and other systems. If you had 300 or 500 of these uh, small UAVs swarming against your ship, could you stop them all? And they don't have to sink the ship, they just need to knock out the communications and whatnot and get a mission kill. So that's a big concern and Navy's looking a lot at that to say, you know, how do we protect the ships that are out there doing their job from something like a swarm attack? So it's, uh, it, it's inevitable, it's the wave of the future. We need a lot of smart people in this business. We need a lot of youngsters who do math and science and the STEM programs and whatnot because these are high-tech systems and that what, that's what you need to, to be equipped with to do that kind of work. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll go this way. That'll work out. Yeah, that'll work out for me. We'll get a robot next time. <laughs> What are the implications for the edu education and training that will be required to follow the shift in technology? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, right now we have seen uh, Air Force is now training more RPA, remotely piloted aircraft pilots, than they are manned pilots. So that's a whole different training pipeline. Uh, what we need our recruits to be able to do is step into that operation. And there's a lot of discussion. Uh, there's uh, some articles called uh, Blue Hair in the Gray Zone and whatnot. It says, you know, maybe if you've got somebody that's really good at doing this unmanned operation, do we care if he or she has purple hair and an earring and maybe weighs a little more than they need to? You know, should we recruit different kinds of people to do the kind of jobs we need? Because we're not going to be able to get everybody we need uh, if we continue to recruit just the kind of people we do today. 
hard sell. You know, somebody says, hey, you're in the military, you're going to be squared away, you're going to wear a uniform and whatnot. If you're going to be different than that, I guess we'll hire you as a civilian, but we don't want to put you in uniform. But we may have to break that paradigm. So, uh, you know, we hope that, uh, you know, high schools and through programs uh, like the Lego League and others that develop expertise in robotics, first robotics and others, that people, you know, students get excited about this stuff. The uh, first robotics competition, uh, uh, Dean Kamen established, and uh, he looked at high school and said, why is it the only cool people are the football players? Again, I don't know how to throw a football. The football players and the, the athletes and the uh, cheerleaders, why don't we respect the nerds who are smart, good at math, and those kind of things? And what they have been able to do with the robot clubs that have been established is schools actually have cheerleaders for the robots. They go to national competitions, and it's really taken a lot of people and said, you know, I do see success in this different path than what we normally do. So I think more of that is needed. Other questions? Are they robotic cheerleaders? Just kidding. <laughs> no, my question is, um, how easy are these drones to hack? Because now anything can get hacked. So if we're sending a drone overseas, you know, you're explaining how it goes, fiber optics, I'm gonna go up to satellite and then back to another controller before they land and everything like that. Um, I imagine there must be measures not to not, not hack them, but how easy is it to hack these drones? You had to ask that question, didn't you? Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the tough areas. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in the, the Reaper world, as we said, they, if they lose that link, the drone is smart enough to turn around and come back to where it originally took off and land itself if it has the right location and the right conditions and whatnot. Uh, the enemy, if they can jam that signal, that, that, that's going to knock them out completely. So, you know, as we're going forward, and, and what we've learned over the past 10 or 15 years of war is, you know, we owned the sky, nobody was really hacking us, you know, we were able to fly when we wanted to fly without any problems. You can encrypt that data, you can protect that data, it's expensive and difficult to do, but you can, and if we find a situation where we're going against a sophisticated enemy, China, Russia, or Korea, or whoever, uh, the current RPAs are not going not to make it. So that's going to have to be an autonomous aircraft that is programmed in advance that says, take off, find your target, execute your mission, return if you can, without any mid-course guidance, without any communications. So uh, it, it's something that you know, everybody's aware of. And uh, the uh, scientists are taking a good hard look at how would you do this in an environment where perhaps there's no GPS satellites either. You know, in, a, in, a, in an ugly war situation, there's no GPS. Nobody knows exactly where they are on the face of the Earth. Certainly the uh, unmanned aircraft won't do it. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a challenge. That's all, that's all I can say, I guess. Other questions? Yes, Jim? <laughs> Ask me at the O Club, OK? <laughs> Any other questions? You have yet? OK, John. OK. How long is it going to be before we won't have naval aviators? Naval aviators? Man. Man of any brand. Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, it's ever going to happen. I think it's always going to be a team kind of operation. Uh, you know, nobody has really ever said that these things are going to do air-to-air uh, -air dog fights. Uh, it's just not in the design. It's not, not being uh, seen. There's a lot of things that a man can, man can do in the aircraft that these guys simply can't do. You can't program every possible, you know, action that might need to be taken and whatnot. So I don't think we'll ever get in the world unless you're talking Star Wars uh, way downrange and whatnot. So, that's why I find, uh, I was called down to testify on Capitol Hill one time, and the question they ask is, you know, how do your uh, students at the War College feel about these things? Are they afraid it's going to put them out of business or whatever else? 
And I think all of us realize we're in a transitional phase and in the uh, 20 years of a career, we may see a change in the way these things are operated, but nobody's gonna get fired because a robot has come along and taken your job. So I don't think it's something we need to fear, it's just something we need to be prepared to reach out and use like any other tool. And uh, you know, if that's the best way to do a job, we ought to use that. You know, If you don't wanna say, we had the ability to take out that target using an unmanned aircraft, we chose not to do so. We sent in a manned aircraft and they got shot down. You don't want that to happen. So you need to be uh, you know, very succinct about what context you're gonna use these things in and how they're gonna do the job that needs to be done. Anything else? I think we're about at closing time, so uh, thank you, it's a pleasure.